to be here with you. And you know, when, one of the things <clears throat> that this meeting is, is a bringing together of a group of people who, many of whom know each other, but these days, because it's so hard to find time to get in one place, this is a chance to connect with your colleagues, meet new colleagues, and we're really pleased that we have an opportunity to do this with you. <clears throat> well, I want to welcome you to the 2014 Forum on Solutions for Health Productivity and Absence Management. As Alex said, I'm Dr. Thomas Perry, IBI's president and co-founder. Uh, IBI's other co-founder, Bill Molman, retired about a year and a half ago, but Bill is here with us today. Bill, you in the back, stand up. <laughs> He's even older than I am, so that's why he retired. So we believe that we've brought together not only the best presentations and speakers on the topics of absence, health, and productivity, really focused on solutions, but also a remarkably diverse and knowledgeable group of attendees. 420 people have come together uh, today in San Francisco, uh, really the leaders in this field. More employers this year than we've ever had before, and it does speak <clears throat> to employers looking for new solutions and trying to look for the best evidence to help them travel down this path. I'd also like to welcome you to San Francisco place that I grew up. You know, when I travel the country, almost without exception, people say to me, San Francisco is one of my favorite places in the world. So what better place to have our forum and what better hotel than the historic Fairmont Hotel on the top of Knob Hill? And I guarantee you, tonight when you go to the Crown Room, the top of the Fairmont, you will have one of the most remarkable views of the San Francisco Bay Area that you've ever seen. So don't miss that. Now, Alex talked a bit about prizes. So there'll be another prize for anyone who can translate this Chinese idiom. And I think somehow it's very fitting for the conference this year. Now, we've all heard this idiom. The popular translation is, may you live in interesting times. And we'd probably all agree <clears throat> that these times are really pretty interesting, if nothing else. However, the actual translation in Chinese is, it's better to be a dog in a peaceful time than to be a man in a chaotic period. <laughs> and I think probably we feel that may be a better translation for what we all see out there in the world. <clears throat> and what is it that's making the world so chaotic these days? Well, <clears throat> obviously, major health care reform legislation in the ACA an economy that is recovering more slowly than everyone had hoped for. Employers have new health care options that would have been unthinkable even five years ago. And they struggle with how to engage employees in their own health. We see a plethora of expanding technology and information sources. Employers fear, feel overwhelmed by the amount of data that is now available to them about the health of their workforce. Yet employers have fewer people today managing benefits than they've ever had before. And finally, investments in health-related programs are under growing scrutiny. This year's conference will address each of these topics in a variety of sessions. So read your program carefully and get the most out of your time with us. Well, Alex uh, did mention a number of our sponsors. Really, you know, we don't have an exhibit hall <clears throat> at this conference, as you all know. We didn't think that was consistent with, really, the, the role of a research organization focused on evidence and, and data and analysis. <clears throat> but we couldn't really run this conference without our sponsors. So I want to thank our sponsors that really helped us with the conference this year, AbbVie, the Hartford, Shape Up, Anthem Blue Cross, Cigna, Sedgwick CMS, United Healthcare, Kaiser Permanente, SSDC, Prudential, Staff Relay, National Pharmaceutical Association, the Standard Insurance Company, Verisk Health, Liberty Mutual, HealthScope Benefits, and Aetna. Thank you very much for your support of the 2014 Forum. 
Now let's get on to the good stuff. Um, we are very fortunate today <clears throat> to have Mr. William Strahan as our keynote speaker this afternoon. Bill is the Executive Vice President of Human Resources for Comcast Cable. Comcast employs 136,000 employees. And Bill said that we were very generous in our uh, materials that we actually gave him a medical degree and called him the Chief Medical Officer, which is not true. Bill is the Chief HR Executive, so I'm sorry for that typo, Bill, but maybe you can use it somewhere. Uh, Bill has worked in HR for nearly 30 years and is responsible for all aspects of human resources at Comcast Cable. He began his career at Macy's and Riggs National Bank, practiced law and comp and benefits in Washington, D.C., and served as a consultant and manager at Mercer HR Consulting, so a, quite a varied background uh, before he came to Comcast. He currently serves on several boards, the Reinvestment Fund specializing in community development, the Emma Bowen Foundation, and the Cable Communications HR Association. <clears throat> You know, I had the pleasure of talking to Bill on the phone um, before the conference, and I found what he is doing at Comcast to be completely different and very intriguing, and I know you'll really enjoy what he has to say. So often, as employers have to deal with really hard business questions, oftentimes their employees kind of get lost in the, in the process. But Bill has found a way at Comcast to be a good business per person, and at the same time, really promote the health of their workforce and the value and importance of employees being at work. So help me welcome Mr. Bill Strahan. Sadly, part of my wealth reg or health uh, regimen is I need, uh, I need glasses at this point. From my perspective, as the head of HR at Comcast Cable, benefits are a tool that I have to achieve my goals and objectives for the company. My primary objective as the HR leader for Comcast is to ensure that Comcast has sufficient talent available sustainably to meet the growing complex demands of our business in a cost-effective and customer-responsive environment. I see this as essentially a risk management exercise. It's easy if you just want to do more in a straight line. It's hard when you have to balance things, when too much can be too much. Pressing too hard on any lever that I have in any one direction throws the whole dynamic out of balance. I view the HR function as a market-based exercise in this way. Essentially, I am a product manager. I'm accountable for producing a product called Working at Comcast. If the product's not attractive, nobody wants to buy it. Nobody wants to work at Comcast. If the product of Working at Comcast is not designed, constructed, delivered, and priced appropriately, then Comcast will fail because it won't have the talent it needs at the point of impact for our customers to deliver its products and services. Or the shareholder is unhappy because we haven't provided good stewardship for how we've gotten there. HR is a market-based exercise. It's not mechanical. It's not if I do this, then they will do that. Excuse me. It's not Isaac Newton as I think it is Adam Smith. As if that one-dimensional balance is not difficult to manage, then there are many other competitors also to be wary of who want to sell their product working for them to my potential talent and current employees. There are also competitors for my shareholders' investment dollars, for their investment of capital, and for the hard-earned money our customers spend with us every month. HR lives in the various markets I'm talking about simultaneously, which are all extremely competitive. If the product is not attractive, no employees. If it draws insufficient talent or has unsustainable cost, our customers suffer or our shareholders get an uncompetitive return. I work in HR because I love complex competition. 
I love the challenge of getting the balance right to offer the optimal employment product for all of these competitions at the same time, labor market, capital market, customer market. Benefits are one of the most impactful resources I have, one of the most attractive and powerful elements I can put into that product of working at Comcast, but also one of the most volatile and the one that's perhaps subject to the most unique risks. Benefits can produce long-term cost exposure to my shareholders and create talent risk. Risk that the right talent doesn't want the product we have to offer. Or that the talent is not suitable, that, excuse me, the talent that is not suitable for the enterprise stays too long. Remember all the markets in which I'm talking about competing simultaneously. As customer markets evolve with new technology and innovation, the talent I need to provide the company is changing, changing every day. Part of why risk management is such an important part of my view of what HR is all about is I have a great deal of respect for not creating the risk of having talent that is no longer contemporary to the business challenges of the day at hand. In other words, talent that stays but doesn't adapt to today's challenges. So I think I have to make a complex calculation every day from my chair. And I ask myself a very simple question early in the process and I ask it continually since. Why do we offer benefits at all? Why? Now, if I may, if your answer is something about World War II price controls or the Kaiser Wilhelm and retirement plans, you can save that for the reunion of your SEBS class. I don't care. I'm going to give you a practice point from my chair now. Your CHRO or your CFO or even your CEO is going to ask that same question soon if they haven't asked you already. And they are going to want a fairly measured answer. They will care even less about the Kaiser than I do. And I'll give you an extra credit hint. Telling them about the tax efficiency of benefits is not going to cut it either. If I were you, I'd ask myself a question. Do you know why your product is worth buying? At Comcast, we know that our employees have varied backgrounds of education and experience and expectations. They have unique needs as families, but we also know that they highly value our benefits. About 85% of them are satisfied or very satisfied. We do a very in-depth employee satisfaction survey which, by the way, tying back to the IBI theme of data, longitudinal analysis on your employee satisfaction survey, parsing out employees who stay, go, who perform well and perform poorly is a great way to support from a data perspective the things I'm talking about. That 85% at satisfied or very satisfied, we're told by our vendors, puts us at about the 95th percentile level of satisfaction. We did a good deal of cohort analysis and we know that we have a large group of employees for whom healthcare is a material driver of our relationship between them and the company. They can replicate wages, but they can't replicate our benefits. We also understand that our competitive position is linked to customer experience. Traditionally, we come from an industry where customer service has been poor in its reputation. And we as an individual company have suffered from that as much as any. We know that having a frontline worker who is engaged is essential to improving and has improved that experience. We need people who have long tenure in their jobs, who are healthy and who are ready to work. Level of satisfaction with Comcast connects directly to our customer experience. That is to say, we have some very clear analytics that suggest that the axiom of employee first really does work. People who are happy with us, people who are proud of us, do a great job for our customers. We offer benefits because it helps to make our employees proud to work at Comcast. There is nothing that I love more than mothers and mothers-in-law sitting at a kitchen table asking questions about the benefit plans at Comcast and babies. We want an emotional connection into the home for the company. There are very few ways to tap into the kind of emotional responses that benefits are witness to 
except for benefits themselves. Many of the most important days of the year for a family include benefits. Maybe some of the most important days of a life. A birth, a diagnosis, a recovery, the call that the doctor needs to give you the results in person. We can't talk to you over the phone, I'm sorry. When benefits show up large on those days, the company shows up large. They're some of the most fertile times to sow the seeds of employee loyalty and engagement. Think of your benefits program as a product and therefore as a two-way flow of value. We're all probably already thinking about the value that we convey through benefits. More time on what we get or could get will make us all better product managers. If you are unclear as to why your company or your client offers benefits, or if you're attempting to offer as little as possible because you think you're trapped, you should get out of here now. This is not a time for the faint of heart, nor for the confused. We offer benefits because it builds our workforce over the long haul. I know it, and I can prove it. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to share more with you about the specific elements of benefits as they integrate into our relationships at Comcast with our employees and talk about how Comcast is tackling one benefit issue, leaves of absence successfully to achieve competitive advantage across the various markets I've referenced, customers, shareholders, labor markets. So let's take a moment and look at Comcast. Comcast Corporation is a delightfully exciting company at the intersection of media and technology. My, my favorite sentence of the whole thing. I, I, a little bit of a poet. It's an enterprise that spans the Olympics, Meet the Press, Saturday Night Live, Fast and Furious. We're the largest provider of high-speed data and pay TV in the country, as well as the fourth or maybe sometimes third largest phone company in the country. We provided low-cost, easy access to the internet for about one million low-income Americans in about 250,000 households. We sponsored the largest corporate day of service in the country and the Harry Potter ride at Universal Studios. We bring you Jimmy Fallon and we are the cable guy. We currently employ about 136,000 employees in 50 states and dozens of countries. Since the beginning of the year, we've announced an investment of $1.2 billion in a 59-story tower in Philadelphia that will be the home of our investment center, excuse me, our, our innovation center as well as a $45 billion acquisition of Time Warner Cable. We're a company that is growing. We deploy capital to achieve big goals, and we press into difficult and inspiring endeavors. As far as the numbers, for revenue, we're at about $65.5 billion. Operating cash flow is about $21.5 billion. Operating income, thirteen and a half, and free cash flow is between eight and nine billion dollars. The cable business is where I spend the majority of my time. I have a counterpart, Pat Langer, who leads HR at NBC Universal. Cable is about two thirds of the employees and the financial strength of the corporation. Maybe because of what we do for a living, maybe because it's what keynote speakers do. I brought a little video. Maybe if the guys could uh, cue up the video, I'd like to share with you a little bit of the spirit of Comcast. The world of entertainment and technology is moving a million miles an hour. And the only way to keep up is to stay ahead. At Comcast, our goal isn't simply to give people what they expect. It's to give them what they never thought possible. It's not a mission we had to invent. It's a mission in our DNA. It's in the people we hire. It's in the shows we create. It's in our drive to inform and entertain in more ways and more places. It's the Olympics on every device. It's a TV library that lives in the cloud. It's a movie theater on the bus. It's a box office in your hand, a home phone that travels. It's a star factory, a magical ride with a young wizard, and a place where education matters. It's in our desire to deliver the largest and most spectacular events on the planet and the smallest and most intimate moments with friends. 
it's even the porch light you can turn off from the road. Challenging, innovating, reimagining. It's a philosophy that's gotten us where we are today and it will get us where we want to be tomorrow. We can't wait to show you what's next. In 2010, we tackled a flawed design in our paid time off policies that resulted in our flex time policy having over 80% of its available days annually being taken in the month of October. Essentially because of historic um, systems issues, every October 1st we gave everybody all of their flex time. The combination of that level of usage in October, flex time in October, there was uh, an impact of a term so egregious that its name was Flextober. <laughs> Flextober was a term so ubiquitous it was used by nearly every call center agent that we have, as well as our CEO. Through some good analysis, design work, change management leadership, we fixed Flextober. In doing so, however, we also determined that we were losing other days throughout the year through what we call LOA, leave of absence. Leave of absence for us in this case means FMLA, short-term and long-term disability and workers' comp. In fact, in 2011, excuse me, 2011, we lost about a million man days of work to LOA. It was about 5% of the available work days in the cable system. Doing a bit of simple arithmetic, assuming that people work about 200 days a year, this meant that the business was bleeding off about 5,000 employees' work of productivity. And it's a stunning number and was a clear impairment to our business. In fact, that was when we raised this issue of leaves and disability management to the level of the board. We now report out twice a year to our board on the status of our efforts to manage the rate of leaves in the organization. Maybe that's a common dynamic, but I don't think so, to have a board involvement of a company our size in an element like this. I'll, I'll deviate a little bit from my prepared outline to also to suggest to some of the questions that were asked about how do you get people engaged, how do you make something like disability important you have to have the backbone to admit that you've got a problem. When you stand up and say, guess what, we've got a problem and you should hold me accountable for fixing it, that's how you can get it on people's agenda. Just for the record, while Comcast identified and prioritized this issue, we're far from alone in dealing with it. I'm also compelled, frankly, to share that I'm a little surprised by how frequently I encounter other CHROs who have more or less absolutely no idea how much productivity is lost in their organization due to leaves. Certainly there are companies and workforces where this is not a material issue because of the demographics of who work there. However, for those with large non-exempt or customer-facing workforces, I bet that it is. As a proxy for the magnitude of these issues and essentially the universality of what I think is some of these issues, I'm going to refer you to an article that was recently published by National Public Radio's Planet Money by Hannah Jaffe Walt called Unfit for Work. If you Google Unfit for Work or Google Planet Money or Hana C-H-A-N-A Jaffe, J-O-F-F-E dash Walt, W-A-L-T, I'm sure you can find the article. In it, she explores how disability benefits under the Social Security Administration have, in her words, skyrocketed over the last three decades. She makes the observation that within the trend, there's also a close correlation between changes in unemployment, its rate, and the incidence of disability. Viewed over a 25-year horizon, the graphical depiction of the two rates are clearly similar. There's also a direct connection between the numbers of people removed from welfare rolls, a 50% reduction over the last several years, and a stark increase in low-income people on disability whose numbers have also tripled since about 1980. Jaffe Walt speaks to the development of the disability industry of consultants and lawyers who work to help people secure these disability benefits from the federal government and move them out of the available workforce. 
One of the most sobering portions of the article acknowledges that disability is increasing partially because the workforce, partially because America, is getting older. I'd like to read just a short piece of that article. But disability has also become a de facto welfare program for people without a lot of education or job skills. It wasn't supposed to service this purpose. It's not a retraining program designed to get people back onto their feet. Once people go on to disability, they almost never go back to work. Fewer than 1% of those who were on the federal program for disabled workers at the beginning of 2011 have returned to the workforce since then, one economist told me, me being Jaffe Walt. I believe that the fact is that employers are operating in a very difficult market environment for talent. The percentages, percentage of adults in the workforce is at its lowest since the late 1970s. It's about 63%, meaning 63% of adult Americans are participants in the workforce, either actively looking for work or working. 63% versus 66% 10 years ago and over 67% at the turn of the millennium. The source of these data are right from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Combined, I think this stands for the proposition that at least for some segment of our collective workforce, the message that work is not essential as a part of normal adult life is getting louder and something that we as employers are now forced to compete with. In other words, there's a countervailing message that our product, working at my company, working at your company, is not a product worth buying. Do I think that there are people that don't want to work, that are people are avoiding, avoiding work? Not really so much. My point is that in the marketplace of trying to earn the attention and the engagement of large portions of who we talk to, to attra attract and retain into our workforces, there are loud cultural messages that run counter to what we're trying to say. So how has Comcast responded to our own particular issues, not these broader societal issues that the article references? By the end of 2013, we had turned the corner. We had gone from that million days of work lost and now had a run rate some 100 to 120,000 days less and had taken about a point of absence out of the system. We put back about 14, excuse me, about 400 of those full-time equivalents and the business stood up and took notice. The productivity gains are being measured in the tens of millions of dollars. So let's go down a level of detail. Average leave duration was reduced from 98 days to fewer than 80, over a two-week improvement in one year. The number of employees on leaves over six months was reduced from over about 580 to about 345, a reduction of 40 percent. Hand-to-hand combat. We contacted each person out on these long leaves and triaged each case for its likely outcome and any anomalies that allowed us to bring people back with an accommodation or to come to an understanding that someone's employment with Comcast should come to an end because they did not want to come back. Although it's only an operational metric, one of the things that I watched most carefully and am most pleased with and I think had one of the biggest impacts is that we cut the average number of days between when an event that triggered a disability occurred and when we saw the first paperwork on that disability. So how do you go about addressing these issues from the perspective of my chair running HR? How did, we receive, how did we achieve these results and outcomes? There were several tactics that we employed that probably look fairly traditional, but which in fact were effective in reducing our days lost. We created a warm transfer between our disability plans and our health care plans. The front end of our health care plans has a specialized engagement team that uses consumer science to help our employees and families optimize their use of plans while also being able to lead to more accountability being taken in the family for their own health. 
wellness, and compliance. The team comes from our vendor partner, Accolade. Accolade is this front end piece. There's a call center element, there's an outreach element, there's a statistical analysis and uh, data analysis element. We engage people at the point of contact, regardless of the reason with the healthcare plan, and we drive them towards the compliance that we think is good for their health and the best way for them to use the plan. Accolade sits between the health plan itself and the company. They are neither, and they are there to um, help the company, help the employee navigate to better usage. When Accolade gets a question from an employee, whether it's about benefit levels, choosing a care provider, even a simple claims question, that implies that there'll be a disability claim. They make a warm handoff to our disability partner, Sedgwick. Conversely, Sedgwick can make a warm transfer to Accolade when they see a claim so that our employee can get the optimal assistance and how to get the best care possible during a medical event. And I'll quickly note here, you'll recall that when I talked about what we count as LOA, we counted FMLA. So, well, gee, that's not quite the same. It's not an out-of-pocket check. It may not even be the employee. A little spoiler alert, if the employee is out of work because their dependent is sick, you're paying for that if you're providing coverage for the dependent. It, it's all the same body of engagement. We also closely, closely scrutinized our plan documents to provide clarity to employees, HRs, and managers on our professional partners so that uh, what our plans did and did not cover was completely evident and known by everyone. We've specifically done a deep dive and are doing a deep dive now, Dottie's here in the room, on behavioral health. That's a huge issue. It underpins uh, a great deal of issues that you face in this area, and if you don't get it right, it can crush you. Making sure that the summary plan description is accurate with how you want to handle all of these issues, while it sounds pedestrian, is a critical step in the process. We also created a centralized return to work team made up of Comcasters, other employees, who maintain contact with those on leave and facilitate a dialogue with local management when an employee is able to return to work, whether on a regular full-time basis or on a partial or accommodated basis. Now, as I said, these few thoughts are fairly pedestrian, hardly worth getting on an airplane in the weather and flying to San Francisco to say or having you sit here and listen to. Yet here we are. So I think there are a few other approaches that we have taken, in some ways much more fundamental approaches, that have made the real difference in our numbers and have captured my attention as the lead for the HR team and community. First and most importantly, as I implied when we engaged the board, the company was willing to look at this issue squarely in the eye for what it is. One of the things we see is that the incidence of LOA is much higher in our call centers. Our call center agents are about 20% of our workforce, but represent about 60%, 3x, of our LOA activities. When you think about that, also consider that we have women and men who are service technicians. All day long they climb ladders, they operate bucket trucks, and they're lifting heavy cabling while they're doing both. And we have a door-to-door -door sales force of almost 8,000 people who are in the elements walking four to six hours a day. Together, these two groups, the technicians and the DSRs, are about a third of our workforce, and presumably they should be at higher risk for leaves because of their greater physical demands in their roles, but they are not. It makes the call center issue all the more dramatic, I believe. I think that there is some learning from how we did all of this that might be helpful to share here. A big chunk of the work was execution. Our partner Sedgwick, led by their CEO Dave Long, one of my hosts for today, and Towers Watson, led by Mary Tavarosi, who I saw someplace here as well, each contributed mightily to the rebuild of administrative processes that led to greater success in managing this issue. We increased the frequency of reviews and communications. We reduced the availability of things like our employee services accounts after a period of time. In other words, we provide our employees free and discounted cable, television, internet services, and we reduced the availability of that over time. 
sadly, in some respects, basically we started doing what we said we would have done a while ago. I think some of this stands for the proposition that administrative elegance works. Plan design can only take you so far. The workforce is probably not as educated and as sophisticated on these matters as you. If you can't deliver these processes in an elegant way that's accessible to them and their families easily, you're shooting yourself in the foot. One of the things that we also realized, however, was that we had to adopt the perspective of the people taking the leave to know how to make the structural and environmental changes that would help them accelerate when they could and would choose to come back. A big piece of this was very specific communication that we began to introduce throughout the entire process. We told people, we want you back at work. Your family wants you back at work. Your best self is being at work where we, your teammates, and your family need and want you. What is the goal of a disability program? It's to return people to work. Your employee's best self really is at work being productive if you believe your own press clippings, which I do. Their family needs and wants them there. Their teammates want them there. Not watching television, not watching their grandchildren, not walking the neighbors, dogs, or children. They should be working. We've designed the plans to have impediments to getting too comfortable being well and also being away from work. When you communicate, tell people that you need them back at work and that is where they belong. If you don't believe that, rethink your career decision. Part of the changes that we've created helps put the whole family on notice that we want our employee back. By removing these courtesy services for cable and internet and changing the economics of that, we're reinforcing the ability of the family to make the collective policy decision that mom or dad should be back at work. That's helpful to us, and we believe it's helpful to the family as a whole. Comcast takes great pride in growing middle-class jobs. We are a large employer and we are a large employer of middle-class people, something I take particular personal pride in. The messages that I'm talking about in the return to work programs help build the sensibility of middle-class thinking among our workforce. Bringing discipline to our leave programs and their execution and our messaging of you should be at work as soon as you're healthy enough to be there helps family sustain a move to a middle-class pattern of employment if they have not yet been there. It helps build independence and wealth for those families. But it's also a way of working, a way of approaching their career, a way of approaching their responsibilities to the company and to our customers that helps us and serves my multiple market approach to why I offer benefits. Middle class families have choices as to how they get services. They assemble their lives in ways that include taking on risks. They take out mortgages. They take out car loans. They commit to tuitions. They commit to a standard of living that if they had to move back from it, makes it hard on them to do so. Helping all of our employees, especially our low paid employees, adopt the perspective of middle class America is a good employment policy. As audacious as this sounds, I believe that through thoughtful benefits work delivered with conviction, we can help maintain and build our middle class capacity as a nation. I know that sounds like a reach. It is not. It is our duty as educated, privileged people in positions of authority over the lives of hundreds of thousands of employees and their families. One other thing that we are in the process of doing in 2014. The final initiative 
is that for multiple business reasons, but also as a direct response to our rate of leave and disability, we're building out formal career progression programs in our call centers. We're providing a means to self-promote, to lever more compensation opportunities, and to move laterally, and that's being launched to all of our agents across the country this year. We hope that knowing there is a rung on the ladder that is better, but is also within the grasp of our agents, will be a motivation to adopt taking on the risk of having something to lose and fulfilling the promise of this role as a great middle class job. I think that the best HR programs, and especially the best benefit programs, are built from the kitchen table back, certainly not from the boardroom down. All of these programs, even the career progression programs, are communicated with tools that are easy for employees to use at their own kitchen tables. My suggestion, following up on the outstanding panel that we heard just before the formal opening of the forum about disintegration, is if you ask yourself, will what I'm about to tell these employees make sense at their kitchen table, when they listen to all the messages that I've delivered, that the company has delivered, if it does not make sense at their kitchen table, it probably just plain old doesn't make sense. One, one last small preachy note from the office of the CHRO. Solve business problems, not benefit problems or even HR problems. No one has or ever really will care about disability or leaves or FMLA organically. What they care about is that the business cannot plan service levels confidently unless a reasonable number of people actually show up for work. Now, not all of our jobs are in call centers. We operate in addition to the tower that we're building in Philadelphia, an innovation center here in Silicon Valley, as well as in the Pacific Northwest and in other high-tech areas around the country. We employ thousands of engineers, programmers, web designers, and other high-tech innovation leaders. Our innovation center here, across the street from Moffitt Field, is where a large measure of the technological innovations of how to interact and leverage connectivity in media and communications are created. What I've learned is that by and large, being good at the governance of leaves for our hourly workforce means that we're skilled and adept and practiced enough to be great at making sure that we can help this elite workforce as well. The work will not be lost if you don't have the kind of hourly workforce that I'm talking about. I make one more point, if I may. Some FMLA or disability programs, and really any other benefits or HR programs, some programs like this, operate in a way where they interact with things like paid time off plans or performance management plans, or sometimes simply have a lack of discipline and rigor in their requirements for compliance. Essentially, they create the opportunity and the incentive for employees to fudge the facts on how they interact with these programs. Employees use the plans in unintended ways for inappropriate purposes, or they conspire with doctors or consultants to make claims that are for their convenience, not necessarily to deceive, but in order to achieve a convenience that the plan creates a hole for. I'm guessing that most of us think we know that some of this happens. In our more cynical moments, we might suggest that we know that our employees are lying to us. We may even go so far as to say they know that we know that they know that they're lying to us. In our serious moments, it bothers us that this is true and that it is what we say. It is what we say as benefit people. We know that our shareholder resources are being squandered and that employees who are following the rules are being treated unfairly, and it really gets under our skin. We wonder how much could be saved from our benefits spend if we could rein in the lying and the misuse of these leaves and disabilities. If that, in fact, is what we are saying, we have missed the most important impact of this deception. By sponsoring a benefit arrangement, 
that encourages your employees to lie to you. You're sowing the seeds of your own failure as an enterprise and an organization. There is a moral authority that is needed to manage large groups of people, to lead teams. Great organizations, those that do big things in the world and for this country, for the communities they serve, for the families that draw their income from those companies, and for their customers. Those kinds of companies are led with an organic moral authority. Not morality in the sense of being above reproach in the eyes of religious or civil philosophers. Moral authority in the sense of a focus on achieving the legitimate goals of the organization and in providing a sustainable economic deal to employees and giving customers a square deal and in being good civic neighbors. In short, managers need to demonstrate that they are not in it for themselves, but organically in it for the organization, its clients and owners, and importantly, for employees. People understand the need to balance those interests in order to maintain the sustainability of an organization. They do not understand when a manager is or appears to be simply in it for themselves or to not care enough to operate the business in the clear transparency of the truth. They notice when management looks the other way to avoid dealing with an uncomfortable reality. When we knowingly tolerate, maybe even institutionalize our employees lying to us about coming to work or the reasons they are out of work, we undercut our moral authority to lead generally. So, from my perspective as a product manager, building this working for Comcast model, I put an enormous value on benefits as a means to make me competitive in multiple markets, capital markets, customer markets, and labor markets. We focused on leaves and disability plans and have used them to try to not only meet the needs of our employees, but also to shape a culture of accountability, authority, and progress. Our lessons certainly won't work for everyone, but they did work for us. I wish you luck. Comcast wish you luck in finding the ones that work for you. With all that being said, I was asked if perhaps we could take some questions. Um, I can take questions. I can also take complaints. I can take outright <laughs> arguments. I can take people telling me, you are absolutely crazy. Uh, if you'd come to the microphone as you did before, ask your question. If you'd also identify yourself, we'd certainly appreciate it. And we'll take a few questions. Uh, while, they're, while, while they're queuing up, um, I did want to thank Tom Parry and the staff of IBI for their work in this field in this week's program. I'm also indebted to Dave North of Sedgwick for his partnership with me and Comcast in sponsoring the conversation with Tom to get me here. Thanks, too, for my friends on the board, Mary and Chris McSwain, and especially Sabrina Davidson of Comcast for not overruling Tom when he asked me to speak. So. <laughs> With that, if you have a question, I'd be happy to try to tackle it. Thank you very much, Bill. As I said before you spoke, terrific. Uh, visionary, and I, I want to thank you personally for your comments. You know, you did mention <clears throat> the Time Warner acquisition. So it's uh, obviously a huge acquisition, and regardless of whether it works or not from the legal standpoint, as you think about bringing in that many new employees with perhaps a different benefit plan, philosophy, structure, workforce, how do you think about integrating them into the organization that you've described? Yeah, thanks, that's a great question and it's, uh, it's topical. Um, if you're an investor, go to the prospectus, don't rely on any of my statements, uh, no forward-looking statements here. Uh, the, the panel answered that question for me in some respects, I think, uh, when uh, the answer was, uh, you know, it's about culture, right? So um, we've done a lot of acquisitions. We've done a lot of big acquisitions. Uh, we like having our benefit programs at the forefront of communications of how we engage a new workforce who's joining the broader Comcast team and family and culture. It says something, hopefully, about the way we speak. Small sentences, plain spoken, hopefully simple plans, and plans that have uh, just a robust amount of focus on business and fairness and kind of getting people at work. So it is a big deal to us. Um, we like it a lot. Uh, we will tend to over-index in benefits more than other areas in terms of saying this really is the one that you have to do. 
Um, when we bought NBC Universal from GE, which was a multi-year process, uh, the recognition was pretty clear. NBC Universal was a vastly different business than the cable business, different labor markets, different capital markets, different customer markets, all the things I referred to. And so by and large, not a reason to slam together HR policies when the market wouldn't dictate that. However, one of the things that was done early on and now with Sabrina and with her colleagues, we have built a single global benefits team between those two organizations because we think the alignment between benefits and the communication of culture is so significant. I imagine it's one of the first things we'll do with Time Warner Cable, assuming that we get regulatory approval and shareholder approval to complete the deal, which is like nine months from now at best. Sir? I'd like to revisit, uh, by the way, Gary Anderberg from Gallagher Bassett. I'd like to revisit the call center issue for just a moment. Now, I realize, of course, we're here talking about benefits. I think it's right between integrated and institute. But I'm curious, when you confronted the issue with call centers, which I've dealt with before myself, did you, in that process, look at the, how those call centers are managed, possibly the training of frontline supervisors, other types of issues that have to do with how people view the product of working for Comcast? And did you approach that synergistically as wrapping the benefits concept around a management concept, or are you looking at it just from the benefits side? Yeah, de definitely. Thank you. Outstanding question. Very insightful. Um, not, not just from a benefits perspective, so from a completely, uh, or at least as completely as possible, uh, integrated basis. So uh, we've done a, a variety of kinds of things. So uh, as I indicated, we are very data focused and attempt to use uh, our employee surveys, which, you know, considering the number of employees we have, um, small deviations are very helpful. When we first looked at the three large divisions that we run the company through, everything, every call center answer was the same. When we went down to the 16 regions that sit below the three divisions, every single one the same. You had to get down really to the call center level, sometimes to the supervisor level, to begin to find the pattern in the data that said there are winners and losers in this proposition. It's raised for us a question of how do we prepare people to move into new supervisory roles and to what extent do we prepare them for leading others and the team basis, that group of maybe 12 to 16 people, which itself is a number that's probably too large. We've done a couple things, uh, a program we called MOSS, making our supervisors successful, and also uh, L L2L, link to leadership, which is how we take high potential hourly employees and prepare them to be supervisors. So the supervisors, I think, are largely the key. We've also done some very simple sorting of supervisors who, when compared with their closest cohort, have weak employee survey scores and on a simple red, yellow, green basis, trying to understand the red ones. And then when you do that all longitudinally and look at places where employee turnover or performance are weak and then compare it to the same set of data, uh, that's pretty much when the magic happens, I think, in terms of understanding things. We've also kind of come at it from a very different perspective. Uh, we engaged uh, Accolade uh, to come and to spend a lot of time to bring some medical professionals, some healthcare professionals into the, uh, into the call centers and essentially ask the question, do we have people who are less resilient than the average American or do we have a work environment that is less able to foster resilience? Uh, the answer, which no surprise to the employer community, um, is always it's both. Uh, it's never not always both, um, but that was a way that we could do a deep dive as well. Um, so we took the data, we also did some hands-on analysis, and that helped inform the benefits actions more so than the benefits actions informing, if you will, the employee relations environment. Hi. Sir? Hello. Yeah, hi. <laughs> I'm Jim Franklin. Uh, I was at a conference four or five years ago where uh, Time Warner and Unum were presenting uh, a very innovative approach that they had to managing you know, problems similar to what you're talking about. I'd be real interested to see how you would benchmark or, or, or map against their experience with what your experience is. 
Uh, I, I will be too, but uh, that maybe maybe two years from now that would be a really yeah. good <laughs> presentation. So the whole though. the whole concept of gun jumping in you know acquisitions makes some of that difficult to do. Um, I don't think we've cornered the market on this though to maybe take it from a different perspective. So um, whether Time Warner Cable has sort of solved for this uh, along with Unum's help or somebody else's help, I'm not. I really don't know, but, but uh, the, just the, from our perspective, these are things that worked for us. But the, I guess the point I was trying to make, too, is Sorry. that the whole approach of benchmarking, uh, Tom and I had done a project many years ago where we got a whole bunch of telecoms together, mm -hmm. and they all shared data, and from that data, we're able to see what best practice might be within that unique environment. Mm -hmm. So I think you have a great opportunity to have a company very similar to yours and, and be able to internally benchmark mm -hmm. where others would have to externally benchmark. That, that's, that is a great point. Um, and one of the nice things about our structure, as I described for this gentleman, having three operating divisions in the cable company and then these 16 regions, and you know each division may have upwards of 20,000 plus employees, so they're, they're big entities, is that by looking at the 16 regions and then the dozens of call centers that may sit under these divisions. Essentially, we've done a lot of the internal benchmarking, and that was our first cut. Now, adding in other telecom organizations and the rest is, is helpful. I, I will suggest, though, that so that's a great idea. You know, Sabrina, I'm sure, is writing that down someplace. Um, the, the, one of the hard things that I think is difficult and is sort of the beauty of um, IBI in terms of, I think, the benefit that is delivered in terms of not just having data, but having quality and actionable data, is getting enough of a definition around data sets and points that things are measured and sequence and, well, you know, how long, how long did something mature before we tick the box that it actually occurred. In other words, just what's the quality of the data? That's one of the issues we face as we did try to go out and get benchmark information, was that it was really, really hard to get information that was consistent enough to know how it compared to our issue. And to some extent, I think we did not always lead with that because the quality of the data was frustrating. So the work of organizations like IBI, specifically in this area, is, is absolutely um, enormous uh, to meeting my needs. I'll go back to one of the things I said, once you kind of put this on the agenda of your board, um, you've put yourself on the hook to figure out how to fix it, uh, and it's not easy. One of the reasons I'm told by our, uh, by various vendors uh, and partners uh, from outside the company that this doesn't always get tackled in HR is the benefit in NORS to the operating part of the company, not to HR. HR goes through the pain, HR spends the money, and somebody's P&L in a business unit are the folks that reap the benefit of it. So I have to say, here's why I'm spending this money, here's why I'm distracting the organization, so that guy and that gal and that team over there can have a better budget year. Um, that's not always easy to do uh, for a lot of reasons, but it's part of the dynamic, I think. Miss? Thank you very much for your comments. Um, they were really quite insightful. Um, I Nim, so. Nim Patel from it was a joke. <laughs> um, HCMS. So, from your seat, what are the one, two, three impressions you are forming and have formed about the Affordable Care Act? Um, so, I'm not a huge expert on the Affordable Care Act, and uh, so you should take my uh, my few comments with uh, probably a grain of salt. Um, one is that. Um, you know, I, th I think it's a, um, I think it's an impetus for a real sea change, meaning a little bit more gradual than I think people think, a little bit more subtle in the movement, and I think among employers like a Comcast or other large employers, potentially not as significant as uh, others might believe, uh, meaning that if we offer, if our intention is to offer benefits because somehow we think that's just a box that we have to fill, and therefore doing it at as low a cost as possible is what success looks like, then ACA is really darn important. To the extent that we view benefits differently, then although it's an environmental issue that I have to manage to, I've got a more fundamental business issue and a more fundamental desire that I want to achieve, and I think it becomes a little less important there. 
Um, I also would suggest, I think, that, you know, uh, like, any, like any great play, um, you know, don't write your review after the first act. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be done yet in terms of uh, payment systems, I, I believe, I would assume, uh, the actual engagement of the healthcare community differently. Um, I think we're not quite there yet to really understand how uh, something that impacts such a large portion of the economy will really play out. I, I remain optimistic. Miss? Perfect. Is this on? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Karen Curran with Pinnacle Assurance. As you were talking about your disability management, did you include your workers' compensation in that disability management? And if you did, did you use the same model or adjust it for the work comp claims? And if you didn't, why not? Okay. So good question. Um, so uh, again, kind of paralleling the, the, the really outstanding panel that we had, one of the things I really, really learned, um, I learned from the workers' comp people, is that the occupational people, the disability people, are crazy. And I learned from them that the workers' comp people are insane. And they're both right. Um, so that was that. That was a little bit of a head scratch for me um, at the beginning. Um, we did not phase in workers' comp at the beginning. Uh, we got a running rhythm of success uh, with the dis disability plans, and I think for good reason. You know, it's sort of a matter of privity. We control that relationship. We control that plan document uh, as opposed to state regulation. Um, you know, much more closely, and it's an opportunity to kind of get good at it. As we've gotten good at it, though, we've rolled in the same kind of return to work dynamics and many of the principles uh, and to some extent the, the messages, and we're now rolling workers' comp out uh, even more rapidly than we rolled out the initial body of work uh, and trying to bring them as close together as possible at the same time, understanding that they are two different benefit schemes. But I think your point's well made, that uh, you can get there. Um, and again, I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but um, to the extent that when you think about administering any of these plans, you, you kind of just look at you know, the, the four squares of what's in the plan and say, my job is to optimize this, as opposed to my job is to optimize the company's position in the capital markets with investors and potential investors and to maximize our position with customers in terms of what we sell and to maximize our role in uh, our position in labor markets. When you begin to take that perspective and then you add on the kitchen table perspective I talked about, it's a lot easier, I think, to get people talking one language. When you start with a plan basis and take that as sort of the anchor point for reality, I think it's uh, not far from a lost cause. Thank you. We probably have time for just one question more if somebody wants to ask it. So look, um, nobody wants to ask it, that's fine. Um, it, the work that the people in this room do is really, really important. Um, and I know that sometimes uh, you feel like you're the only people that understand the issue that you're dealing with. You're the only people that understand there's rules and limitations of economics and regulation and actuarial science and pattern and practice, and that a lot of the times the folks that you deal with uh, just don't get it. Um, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worth doing. The work that you all do from the employer side, from the vendor side, as well as from the association side with places like IBI is critically important. It's capable of being done better than we collectively do it now, I believe, but I think this is the audience to do it. Thank you very much.